Hi. Are these turned on? No. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's speaker, Mike Peters. He's a cartoonist for the Dayton Daily News, and he's going to show some slides and give a real good talk. I'd also like to invite you to come to tomorrow's movie and tomorrow afternoon's discussion and tomorrow night's speaker. They're all mentioned in your programs. Thank you very much. Uh, listen, I want to get down next to you guys, okay? And so, um, and this thing, is this on? Okay. Uh, uh, can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Oh, great. Okay, then I'll, I'll, I, I just won't play with that right now. I'll just start uh, talking. How are you doing? I've never been here in Ames, Iowa before. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I've never been in Iowa, in fact. And uh, so this is really quite an experience. Uh, uh, I, uh, I walked around the city a little bit, and that was really quite an experience. I wanted to, I wanted to, um, I wanted to make myself feel a little more at ease, and so let me. Um, I like to tell you a story, maybe. Okay. Uh, uh, this happened. This happened about four or five months ago. I, I make a lot of speeches. Uh, I mean, not no, not, I don't make that many in, in Ames, Iowa, but I make some speeches around the country and. Uh, and around uh, my hometown, which is Dayton, Ohio. And uh, um, I don't enjoy making speeches that much because I get nervous, you know, and I get very upset. And I stutter a lot whenever I get nervous, which is kind of strange. And, uh, but when I make a speech, uh, 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 the people usually send me a little notice saying, uh, be at a certain time in a certain place. And and I used to keep it on my board. I don't have a secretary, so I keep everything on my board. And then I, I see, oh gosh, you got to be in Ames, Iowa, you know, next Thursday, you know, or something. And so, uh, and so this one day, I was supposed to make a speech at uh, a hospital in uh, in Dayton, Ohio, called Kettering Hospital. And uh, it's a super nice hospital. And uh, it was supposed to be in the morning to a bunch of ladies, okay, to a large group of, of, of women who are who are uh, nurses and, and internists and stuff like that. And I thought I was supposed to be there at like 8.30 in the morning. So I was in the shower around 7.30. It takes about 20 minutes or 30 minutes to get to the hospital. And so I just tried it. I just tested it because we had a baby about six months before. And I had, I had learned the fastest way to get to this place. And so, uh, uh, and so I was in the shower and my wife came in, and she's an English teacher, and she's very organized, and um, she said, uh, hey, you know, your speech isn't at 8.30, your speech is at 8 o'clock, dummy. And I'm saying, what, what's you know, I, I'm, I'm looking around the shower for, it's 8 o'clock and it's 7.30 right now, you're gonna be late. Oh my God, I said, well, um, listen, I said, uh, you know, call up the hospital, I said, I'll get dressed, I'll go on down there, and, uh, and, and I'll uh, tell them I'm just gonna be about 15 minutes late. She said, fine, so I put the towel around me, I ran out into the bedroom, I got on my clothes, I'm putting on my pants, walking down the steps. Uh, I made it into my car, putting on my shirt, I'm driving. I make it to Kettering Hospital about 35 minutes, okay? I'm about 20 minutes late. And uh, I pulled into the emergency entrance where I was taught to, told, I was taught to go by my wife, so I always pulled into the emergency entrance when you have to be there. And uh, these two guys in white come running out like this. And I said, I said, I got to make a speech. My Peters, you know. And so I, uh, I took my drawings and I, I walked. And I said, park my car. You know, people do that. I said, park my car, please. <laughs> <laughs> I go inside this hospital, and uh, some lady is sitting at a desk. And I said, I said, I'm, I'm Peters. The day they are is supposed to make a speech here this morning. She, oh yeah, they're all waiting for you in this auditorium. But a crowd, about your size, nice size crowd. And uh, I run into this auditorium, and uh, and uh, uh, there's some guy uh, trying to uh, trying to you know he's filling up the time until I get there, and he's some doctor. And doctors, you know, can't they don't know what to do in front of crowds all that much. Have you ever listened to a doctor in front of a crowd? You know, it doesn't. And so he was taking paper, and he was tearing paper and making little men and stuff. <laughs> and so he's there, and he's tearing, and he looks, and he says, oh, here's our speaker now. You know, everybody kind of turns around. And I come on down, 
down, uh, uh, down the, the hall, and everybody goes about three or four rows back, okay, three or four rows back from the front. And I don't like being up there. See, I don't like it. I don't like that. You know, I would much prefer to be down here with a handheld. Thank you, handheld mic. And so, uh, so I wanted to get closer to these people. So I walked up about three rows into the aisle, and I walked in about the middle row, and I got up on one of on one of the uh, the backs of the chairs, okay. And I said, uh, I said, uh, I said, I'm really sorry I'm late. I said, but uh, you know, I'm Mike Peters, and I and, and I dressed in my car. Well, they just thought that was hysterical. They just loved that, you know, that I dressed in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, um, I'm an editorial cartoonist. You know, there aren't that many around, you know, like me. Well, they just thought that was really funny too. And I really thought this was a marvelous group, you know. And I said, uh, I said. Uh, you know, oh, thank you very much. Okay. I said, no, you don't really need that. Thank you, though. I, I love this. I love it. I love it. And so I said, uh, I said, uh, I'm an editorial cartoonist, and, and we're fairly professional. Well, they just love that, too. They thought that was hysterical. And I thought, God, this is great, you know. And I leaned down to this one nurse next to me, and I said, hey, you know, you've got a great group here. And she says, that's because your fly's open. I'm sitting, there, I'm sitting there, you know, exposing myself to all these ladies. And you know what you, you, know what you do in a situation like this? And this happened, like I said, about, about four months ago. Uh, what you do in a situation like that, and it's human nature, okay? You, uh, now, you've been exposing yourself for three minutes here. <laughs> You, uh, you turn your back to them to zip yourself up. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Isn't that strange? You know, but think about it. You know, uh, uh, I did it. And, uh, and I turned back around, and I started giving the rest of the speech, and they were dead. You know, <laughs> dead. And about halfway through, I wanted to open a raincoat or something. <laughs> but those are some experiences that happened to editorial cartoonists. Now this, now, this speech is supposed to be about, uh, about political humor. And... Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a cartoonist, and I deal in politics, but I can't tell you about what is political humor. I can tell you a little bit about myself, and I can tell you about some of the problems that I've had as an editorial cartoonist, and maybe we can wrench some sort of political humor out of this. Uh, uh, I started, uh, I always wanted to be an editorial cartoonist, uh, ever since I was a little bitty kid. I read an editor, you know, I read in... Uh, or somebody told me when I was about 13 years old that only editorial cartoonists can win the Pulitzer Prize, okay? <laughs> Which didn't really make that much, you know, so what? I mean, what's the prize? But the other thing that the person said to me when I was 13 years old is that when you win a Pulitzer Prize or any large award like that, from that day that you win that award, to the end of eternity. Now this is really a heavy statement, okay, for a 13 year old. Listen, listen. Uh, when you win a Pulitzer Prize, the day you win it, until the day that our society, our, our civilization ends, okay, you ready for this? Your name, every year, is printed in the Farmer's Almanac. <laughs> This was immortality. You know? <laughs> and my great 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 grandkids could, could say, You see, there, my great great grandfather back in 2006 won a Pulitzer Prize. Well, so I decided, okay, that's what I want to do. Uh, 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 for the rest of my life, I want to be an editorial cartoonist. And so, uh, so I went to school, I went to, I went to, uh, I went to grade school, and, uh, and I was already in high school at 13. I went to high school, an all boys Catholic military. High school, marvelous, marvelous experience. <laughs> I became a, I became a religious Prussian, you know. <laughs> I goose-stepped my way through four years, um, and then I went to college. Uh, now, when I was graduating from college, I, 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 uh, I started looking around for a newspaper to go with to become an editorial cartoonist. And that's when I started finding out problems about editorial cartooning. There's only 120 editorial cartoonists in the country. Okay, it's a very small group, and uh, and when you want to become an editorial cartoonist, 
because it's so small, because it's because there aren't that many people, it's very hard to get a job. You know, uh, newspapers don't don't wake up one day and say, and the editor says, hey, I'm going to hire myself an editorial cartoonist. That's not the way it happens. See, usually they have an editorial cartoonist, and he usually gets sick and dies. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when they hire an editorial cartoonist. So when you're graduating from college, and you want to be an editorial cartoonist, and you want to go and work at some newspaper until somebody dies, if you want to look around for a newspaper that has a very old editorial <laughs> cartoonist. So that's what I did my whole senior year. I was a friend. Uh, I spent most of the year taking editor and publisher yearbook. Have you ever seen editor and publisher? It's got all the names and numbers of all, all newspapers around the country. And uh, I spent most of the year taking my quarters and calling up these newspapers. And now, when I look back at it, it sounds very crazy, because I would call them up and I'd say, uh, how do you do? I'm, I'm taking a survey for uh, my colleague. Uh, you have an old editorial cartoonist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and people didn't know how to react. And, and they would say, why? I want a survey, you know, <laughs> college kids, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, 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 and so I found out that, and I was living in St. Louis at this time, I found out that the oldest editorial cartoonist in the country at that time, which was 1965, was living in Chicago, okay, which is very close to St. Louis. And, and his name was Cecil Jensen. And this guy was old. They would wheel him in, okay, into his office. And they would have him hooked up to those machines that go beep, 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 the little thing sucking, you know, <laughs> and, you know, that they put a mirror under his nose, and if any fog was there, then he could draw that thing. You know? <laughs> I was kidding about the mirror, but the, the rest of it. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so I went up to Chicago, and I got a job with the art staff with the Chicago Daily News, his newspaper. And, uh, when, and now when you're with an art staff, it's not like when you're doing editorial cartoons, because it's a lot of fun. Uh, you're anonymous. People don't know that you're alive. You're, you're with a staff of, say, eight or nine people. And you sit there at a drawing board, and, uh, and somebody from the sports page comes in and says, hey, hey, Darwin is going to hit number 436 or something, and well, we need a cartoon. And then you draw a little cartoon of Hank Aaron, you know. And then they would stick it on the paper, and you wouldn't have to sign it. And it was great. They paid you money. And, uh, but your neck wasn't on the line. People wouldn't say, that was a lousy for doing a Hank Aaron. See, that nobody cares that you're with this art staff. So I was with this art staff, okay? But I was waiting around for Cecil to get the bucket. <laughs> now, every morning, I would come into the newspaper, and I'd get off the elevator, and right next to the elevator door was Cecil's room. And you, and you knew that he was in there because you could hear the dee 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 dee. And so every day I would, I would, I'm <laughs> joking. <laughs> but we cartoonists can, you know, we can exaggerate things. That's our job. We're supposed to exaggerate, you know. That's our. And so uh, every day I would, now this isn't, isn't an exaggeration. Every day I would come in, and I thought this was really funny, see, because this guy knew that I was waiting around for him to die. <laughs> he knew there was some kid on the art staff who really wanted his job. So every day I would come in and I'd peep around, you know, the door, and I'd say, uh, I'd say, hi, Steve, how you feeling today? Ah, I'd laugh, you know, he'd look at me, you know, and go back to his mirror or whatever. <laughs> and I did this for about uh, nine months. It was, it was funny. I, I kept thinking, it just got funnier and funnier. You know those bizarre kind of things, you know, you know, when you keep thinking something is funny. I had that joke that I always thought was funny. And no one else ever thinks it's funny. And uh, and uh, I told it to to special groups just to you know take a survey. Uh, the joke is, uh, why is there only one Eiffel Tower? Now now believe me, nobody thinks this is funny except me. Okay, why is there only one Eiffel Tower? I don't know. Why is there only one Eiffel Tower? Because it eats its young. See? <laughs> okay. Isn't that all? See? Well, okay, one person. <laughs> I can be walking down the street and think of that joke. Right? Like, okay, well, the Cecil Jensen thing just got funnier and funnier to me. You know, I kept looking around. Hey, Cecil. Okay, so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm, in, I'm in the art staff one day. And I'm drawing Hank Aaron for the 18th million times. And, uh, and uh, 
somebody comes running in and says, it finally happened, you know, Cecil's head just hit the, you know, the table. <laughs> like, oh, fantastic. Well, uh, uh, during the night, I, uh, every night, I would be in, in our extra bedroom, I'd be doing those editorial cartoons, getting ready for the day that Cecil was going to be gone. And so, uh, so I had stashed them in my desk, and so I took out the cartoon. I ran inside the editor of the editorial page's office. They're wheeling them on. I kind of stood in a sad room. And I ran inside this guy's office. And it's terrible because I can see Cecil's eyes. <laughs> okay, so, so I run into the editor of the editorial page's office, and I said, I said, Gee, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm really sorry about Cecil. I know his chair isn't even cold yet, you know, but I've got some cartoons here. I'd like to see. And the guy said, no, really, this really isn't the time. You know, it's kind of too soon. He said, this, I said I'll, I'll, come, I'll, I'll come back after lunch. And the guy said, no, no. <laughs> you know, he said, come back in about two weeks, OK? And then we'll see if he's really out for good or not. <laughs> so I came back in two weeks. And uh, he hadn't come back. And so they said, well, we might start, you know, let's see your cartoon. So I looked, showed him my cartoon. And, uh, and, so, they, uh, and so he looked at him, and he liked him. And he said, uh, next Wednesday, we'll start using you on the, on the op-ed page, okay, which is the opposite editorial page. We, newspaper people know this jargon, you know, op-ed page. And so, uh, <laughs> and so, uh, so I said, oh, fantastic. So I went out with my wife, and we celebrated. And we bought a new comic. We, we, bought, we spent all our money. We were living in this little bitty place. And we bought a brand new um, townhouse. I mean, uh, I mean, we wanted to move into a new house anyway, but this made it for sure. Yeah. Be making more money, so we bought it, this townhouse. And uh, and the day I signed the deal, I came back to the office and I found a letter there, two days away from drawing my first cartoon. And the letter was from uh, of, the, of the U.S. government, and I got drafted, okay, and drafted into the army. And I always kind of felt that Cecil. <laughs> No, really? Does somebody do this? Oh, that's great. Uh, they make they make at this one place. We went to the the Dead Bowl or something like that to eat, <laughs> and they make uh, and they make amaretto something very strong. <laughs> okay, so so uh, what is in that? <laughs> no, really, there is something in that. Uh, uh, Okay, okay, so I got drafted. I got drafted. Went into the army, and uh, they made me a cartoonist. Never did understand that. Because I was a cartoonist, you know. <laughs> and uh, then uh, I was in the army for two years. Came back to Chicago because they have to rehire you to see if you get drafted. And uh, this is where we have draft, obviously, in us. And uh, I came back to Chicago. And in the two years that I was gone, they had hired a new cartoonist named Bill Malden. You know Bill Malden, William Joe? She looked surprised me. He's in, he's in the former's open <laughs> And uh, so I came back, got my old desk back and everything. And uh, so the second day I got there, I started, uh, I got this idea, you know. And, I, and so I lean into Bill's office and I said, Hi, Bill, how are you feeling today? Well, he had heard what I did. <laughs> you know, this other guy. And I swear, this is true. He calls up this editor in Dayton, Ohio, who, who he had met at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. And he said, uh, Yeah, I got a kid I want you to hire as your editorial cartoonist. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and no, I swear. And this guy said, OK, Bill, I'll hire him. And he hired me side <laughs> I got this job. It was marvelous. I mean, you know, because he came in and he said, oh, hey, I got you a job as an editor of the You know, get off my back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's really crazy. I've got a little story. I've never told this to anybody about Bill Molden. It, it, it's really weird. The reason why I was drafted was because I had signed up for the draft. At that time, in 65 or 66, you could sign up and be drafted. Can you imagine, can you imagine what I'm telling you? And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, I, and, and so I wasn't going to do that. I was married, and I had a wife, you know, in a townhouse, you know. And, uh, and so I went into Bill Malden, and I had gone in, uh, uh, I mean, I had called, I had known Bill Malden from, 
from St. Louis, but it seems like the cartoonist there. <laughs> yeah, well, with the St. Louis Post Dispatch, and I and so I I had gone into Malden's office, you know, many times as a kid, and I went into Malden's office, or I called him up, and I said, uh, I said, Bill, I said I want to be an editorial cartoonist, you know, here I'm graduating from college and all this, and I said. Uh, or, or, or I was or I was working at the Chicago Daily News. I want to be an editorial cartoonist. He said, uh, "I'll tell you what to do." He said, "I made my fame and fortune in the war." And he said, "So you want to sign up for the draft and go to Vietnam?" And I said, "By God, you know he's true. You know I've got up front his book, you know about the war. And I'll do that." Now when I look back on it, <laughs> you know if I told some kid, you know see war, <laughs> you know, who wanted my job. That would sound very bizarre, you know. I never, forget, you know, well, nevertheless. Okay, okay, so so I got this job in the Nate Daily News. And uh, the greatest day in my life, okay, uh, uh, was the day that I was leaving the Chicago Daily News as a staff artist to go to Dayton, Ohio to become an editorial cartoonist. You know, you've got to understand that when you become an editorial cartoonist, that's your only, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 what is it when you're pushed up? You know, that's your only, you know, what? Promotion. promotion. That's your only promotion, okay? I mean, when you're an editorial cartoonist, I mean, when you become one, that's your only promotion. Old, I mean, when you become a, an older editorial cartoonist, you, you don't become an editor. You just become an older editorial cartoonist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you keep sitting at a board, and we were talking about that earlier. And so the only promotion that you're going to get in your whole life is when you're made an editorial cartoonist. And uh, be a member of this hundred, this elite group of 120 guys. So I'm sitting at my desk, the last day I'm about to leave the Chicago Daily News, and in comes Bill Walden, you know, uh, Farmer's Almanac. And John Pichetti, another former Almanac, they come in and they say, uh, now that you're one of us, see, now that you're one of us, we'd like to take you out to lunch. You understand what this means? <laughs> I mean, and now I'm an editorial cartoonist. This is my big promotion. And now, and now I'm going to be a member of their group. You know, I have visions of them of them showing me the secret handshake or, or <laughs> giving me a, a decoder ring or something. I, you, know, you know, I didn't really know what to expect, but I knew that we three were equals now. See, we were three editorial cartoonists. And did you ever, uh, uh, were you ever in that kind of situation where you were full of yourself and, and you were aware of everything that was going on? You know, we three editorial cartoonists are getting on an elevator. <laughs> we three editorial cartoonists are going to go out lunch, you know, in their Ricardo. You know, here's the editorial cartoonist's table, you know. He's got three chairs there, you know, for me, Bill, and John, you know. Marvel, marvel. Okay, so, so we all sat down, and we talked about, you know, we talked editorial cartooning talk, you know. Well, what pen do you use, you know, and all that And, and, uh, but the weird, uh, you know, but it dawned on me, now I'm, I'm going to leave this group, and I'm going to go up to my office, I'm going to clean out my desk, I'm going to get on a bus and I'm going to go to Dayton, Ohio, but what am I really supposed to be doing there? I mean, what's my job supposed to be? Uh, because I'm always just been a cartoonist, but being an editorial cartoonist is special. And so, so I said to Mama, I said, what is, you know, what's my main function supposed to be when I go to Dayton? I mean, what am I really supposed to be doing? Am I supposed to make people laugh? Uh, you know, am I supposed to put across the, you know, uh, what the news is of the day? He said, uh, he said, there's only one thing you're supposed to do. Ah! <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been wanting to do that for Okay, uh, uh, there's, only one thing, uh, there's only one thing that you're supposed to do. And that is to get people to guess. <laughs> I didn't say that, that was mold. Okay. <laughs> he said, if you get people, you know, mad, if you get people mad, then you're fulfilling your function. An editorial cartoonist is not supposed to... Uh, convince somebody of some something. I mean, you know, I don't think anybody's ever seen a cartoon. Like, if, if I like Nixon, okay, and if I saw a pro-Nixon, I mean, if I, if, I, if I like Nixon, if I saw an anti-Nixon cartoon, I would say, oh, by God, he's right. You know, Nixon's really a scumbag or whatever. <laughs> Nixon is a bad, uh, bad example. Carter, you know, let's say, okay? So a cartoon does not necessarily convince people of certain things. It doesn't, 
You know, you don't see a cartoon that says, oh, God, that's amazing. You know, I, I felt this way, but now I feel this way because of that. Editorials do that because editorials are very fair. You know, they're very ponderous. They give all sides of this spectrum, you know, and they say, Sure, Nixon's a scumbag, but he's nice to his mother. You know? <laughs> okay, but 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 cartoons can't do that. They can either say Nixon's nice to his mother or Nixon's a scumbag. You know. Okay, so so uh, uh, so Malden said, since you can't convince anyone of anything, then maybe in a cartoon you can make them mad enough to feel one way or the other. I mean, depending upon them, whether you like. Uh, Jimmy Carter, whether you don't like him, if you don't feel anything about him, if you feel nothing about him, if you're totally apathetic about Jimmy Carter, and you see a vicious Jimmy Carter cartoon in a paper somewhere, you'll say, wait a minute, that's not fair. Jimmy Carter is a Christian, you know, or something. <laughs> see, that cartoon has made you mad so that you will feel something and that you'll make some sort of commitment in your own mind. Great. Could understand that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. Fine. All right. So I said, that sounds great to me. My job is to make people mad. That's easy. I can do that. You know, I make people mad all the time. I used to get thrown out of school, you know, all the time. I'm uh, doing pictures of my principal. You know, I, you know, if I get my principal mad, I can do it anybody else mad. So, uh, so I got on a bus. And it was on a Sunday. And I, I went from Chicago to Dayton, Ohio. I'd never been to Dayton before. And all the way down there, I'm getting mad, you know, I'm trying to rev myself up, you know, I'm saying, you know, the war is going on. You know, I never felt any of the war. You know, the war is going on. I'm gonna, I think it's outrageous that we're in this vicious war. You know, I'm really getting, it's like a mad dog, you know, he's kind of sick. You know, I'm saying, uh, I'm saying, there's a lot of crime around here, but it's just something. Like that. Okay, so we pull into the Dayton bus depot. It's an old bus depot, and, I, I, and this is after six hours of me working myself up. When I get off the bus, I'm mad now, okay? And I get off the bus, and I look around, and I say, look at this old bus depot. You know, Dayton ought to do something better than this, you know? Dayton's a big town, you know? I look down, there are a couple of bums asleep, you know, next to the bus depot. Look at those bums, you know? They shouldn't be here, you know? They should be, you know, put them away somewhere. You know, I was like a hired gun with two, two uh, you know, two pinpoints on my, uh, 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 in my holster. I'm ready to shoot anything. Okay, so I take my luggage and I start to cross the street. It's on a Sunday now. And I hear these, I hear this voice say, uh, hold it there, buddy. And I'm on the other side of the street and I look around and there's two cops there. They're going to give me a ticket for jaywalking. Okay, my first, my first five minutes in Dayton, Ohio, they're going to give me a ticket for jaywalking. In Chicago, you can sleep on a street, and, and, <laughs> and nobody pays any attention to you. I jaywalk, and they're going to give me a ticket. And I'm obviously new, because I'm holding suitcases and stuff. And, and I'm mad, OK? I'm mad. I'm also flushed with power, you know, because I think I'm a member of this 120 elite group. You know? And I said something to these cops that I'd never say today, you know. I said, uh, I said you know, I put down my luggage, and I said, you know, you boys are I'm making a big mistake. <laughs> and, and, uh, I thought, that sounds crazy, but this is true. And, and, and the cop said, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, they're right. I said, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Mike Peters. <laughs> Needless to say, nothing, you know. Mike Peters, good. <laughs> I said, uh, I'm going to be the, uh, editorial cartoonist for the Dayton Daily News. I kind of, I, I mean, when I said that, I kind of had the feeling that they were going to do like what Bella Lugosi does when you show them a cross, you know, they were going to go, oh my God, you know, they were going to show some emotion, you know. <laughs> Nothing. Dayton Daily News. Good. That's where you work. Okay, and I came up. And now I'm really mad because I've shot off both my guns and, and they're not doing anything. And I said, uh, I said, do you guys have a lot of crime here in Dayton, Ohio? He says, Right, right, you know. And I said, and you're out, and you're, and you're arresting guys who are obviously new in this town. You're arresting them for jaywalking, and you got people being raped and killing throughout. The town. <laughs> yeah, raped and killing. <laughs> <laughs> well, by this time, I'm knocking the guy on his chest. And I'm saying, I'm saying, will you watch the paper on Wednesday, my friend? I'm going to do a cartoon about you guys. All right, bye. They gave me a piece of paper. I started off to find luggage up to the office. 
But on Monday, I did up probably the greatest cartoon I've ever done, okay? This cartoon, it was uh, all encompassing. It was a street scene. I wanted to show a lot of crime going on. I wanted to get a lot of papers, okay, in this cartoon. And, and so I had these, I had these hoodlums stealing the wheels off of a blood mobile that's kind of <laughs> <laughs> Mugging a little old lady, and she's like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, I had some guys breaking into a bank, and you see the siren grrr, going off, and they're breaking the glass, you know. And I had this little kid with Mickey Mouse ears, okay, and he's crossing a street, and I had these two cops there, and they had kind of noses like that, and they're, like, <laughs> and they're, kind of and they're, and they're looking at the kid with the Mickey Mouse ears, and they're saying, catch him, a jaywalker! You know, it was really marvelous. You know, it showed all this stuff. You know, it was exactly what, 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 what the situation was on Sunday. So I knew that this was going to really you know, get people out of mad. You know? And so I put it in the paper. And uh, the paper gets out around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And around 5 o'clock, I get this phone call. And uh, I'm ready for this onslaught of hatred, see, and from the people, see, which I'm trying to do. And uh, I get this phone call. The guy says, uh, hello, is this the cartoonist uh, who did the cartoon today? And I said, yes, it is. And he said, uh, well, this is Chief uh, Rover O'Connor from the Dayton Police Department. I said, well, Chief Grover O'Connor, <laughs> of the Baker Police Department. I said, uh, I guess you guys are pretty pissed about that cartoon, weren't you? He said, no, I thought it was adorable. I'd like to have the original. <laughs> 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 see, you understand what's happening here? And, and I said, uh, I, and I started stuttering then, uh, like I do. And I said, uh, yeah, but I had the cops, and, you know, with the snoops and stuff, and they were arresting that little kid, and he said, yeah, that's why we like it, because it showed that we're doing our job. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so for the next about four months, oh, oh, sorry, the next about, the next about four months, that's the way it was. Every cartoon I do, I couldn't get anybody mad. <clears throat> Everybody, everything I did was cute. I did, I did have this one cartoon, I don't even remember what the subject was, I mean what the situation was, but I had to remember I had Nixon's head, okay, coming out of a toilet, okay, and he's got his fingers and he's looking out and he's saying, flush me, you know, and he's something and they come up here something. And uh, nothing. People were calling me up, hey that, that Nixon cartoon, I love him, I love that that cartoon. <laughs> And it was a bunch of ladies, and they were uh, anti-abortion people or something. But they were called the Demoms Club. The Demoms Club. And they had gone into a county commission meeting, okay, in Dayton, Ohio. And they asked for something, and we, we had this little old county commissioner <coughs> named uh, Carroll, Tom Carroll. And, uh, and, and he told these women no, that they couldn't have whatever they wanted. So then they got upset and they turned over some tables, okay? Which are, you know, in this county commission meeting. It's not a big story, but it was a funny story. So I thought, oh, I'd do something cute on that. So I did a bunch of these uh, uh, demands, three or four of these demands, and they're standing on, on Mr. Carroll's back. Now, the demands stood for determined mothers on the move. Okay, they all had determined mothers on the move. Okay, and these were large mothers, okay? Standing <laughs> <laughs> on Tom Carroll's back. I had Tom Carroll down on the ground and they were and, and like this. And you could tell it was, see, this is funny. Uh, uh, you could tell it was Tom Carroll because I wrote Tom Carroll. <laughs> uh, that is 
precise. See, did it ever dawn on you that after all cartoonists are the only people, are the only artists that can do that? <laughs> you know, we can get away with doing that. If you can't do a caricature of somebody, you hide their face a little bit and you just write their name. <laughs> you know, no other artist does that. Can you see, you know, you know, Michelangelo's Pieta with Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, so uh, uh, and so I had and so I had Tara and Carol laying on the ground, and a bunch of these determined mothers on the move standing on his back, and they had high heels, and you saw these holes in his back, and his blood coming out of his face. And uh, and one of the determined mothers on the move is saying to you with a little bubble, you know, all we want to do is make an impression. Say an impression. That's terrible cartoon. You know, it was throwaway. It was like, you know, I wasn't expecting. It. Standing relations. So, uh, uh, so I put the cartoon in, and I'm thinking about the next day's cartoon. Like I said, the, cart the paper comes out around 4 o'clock. Around 10 after 4, I get this phone call. It's uh, four months now. It's four months of me trying to get people mad. I get this phone call, and I pick it up, oh, you know, I'm thinking that somebody's going to think I'm cute again. And uh, some lady said that was the most vile piece of human excretion I've ever seen in my life today. And I said, oh, God love you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> because I made this lady, lady mad, you know, for some reason. And then she hang up, hung up on me. And then some other lady called up and said, uh, now this is an anti-abortion group. And she said, if I was your mother, I'd have an abortion today. You know, <laughs> you know these people were mad, you know. And then some other lady called up and she said, I'm a member of the Demons Club, and we're going to come down and pick it. Pick it your newspaper tomorrow for that vile, you know, cartoon in the paper today. Well, it's like your first love. You know, I've been, I've been hoping and praying for this, and all of a sudden I've gotten everybody mad. It was marvelous, and they were going to even come down and pick it. So I called up my boss, Fanny. He's over in his other office. And, uh, and, uh, and I said, well, well, Jim, I really did it. You know, those the moms are really mad at me. He's not proud of you. I'm proud of you. You know, you, you know, you should sleep well. I said, yep, sure am. I said, you know, I said, Jim, they're so mad that they're going to come down and pick at your paper too long. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was really, really great. He said, what? <laughs> I said, they're going to pick it. You know, they're so mad. He said, what, 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 why are they mad, Mike? I said, um, I said, I don't know. I don't know. And boy, oh boy, you know, they are really speedy. He said, uh, Mike, you've got to meet them. I mean, that's our policy. If, if we ever have pickets, which we had maybe twice in the history of the day, <laughs> we usually go down and pick it. I mean, we usually go down to the picketers and, and meet them and, and debate over what the issue is. I said, oh, that's okay. That's okay. I don't mean to do that. You know, I'll let you do that. You're, you know, you're not a, no, no, no. You've got to go down there. And so and he said, uh, you've got to find out why they're mad. I said, I don't know why they're mad. He said, well, then you have to find out what the issue is. You know, why did they want the county commission to help them? Why didn't the county commission help them? And you've got to take the side of the county commission. And you've got to be able to argue for the county commission. I said, okay. So I got a bunch of newsprints out of the morgue, out of the library. I got little debating cards. And I put down all these, you know, philosophical reasons why I drew this card. I just drew it because I wanted to fill up the page. You know, that's why, that's why we do most things, you know. And so but I, had to, I, had to, I had to legitimize whatever statement I was making. And so the next day, around, at around 10 o'clock, uh, they started milling around downstairs on, uh, uh, on, on the ground floor of the Dayton Daily News. About 180 people, okay? <laughs> 100 women and hundreds of kids, you know, and they're all walking around and walking around in a big circle. And there are a couple of them are carrying large blow-ups of my cartoon saying, is this what we want in Dayton, Ohio, written across? It's really a trick, you know, seeing your stuff blowing up like that. And, uh, and they're walking around, and uh, I'm upstairs on the third floor, okay, I'm looking out the window, and uh, CBS, our local CBS station comes there, and they're taking movies of it all, you know, and he looks up, and I've got my nose against the window, I'm waving, I'm like, come on, come on, you know, I'm really enjoying it. And so, uh, and so Fane came in, and Fane said, okay, uh, we've all got to go down uh, uh, downstairs and uh, meet these women. I said, okay, all right. We all went on downstairs, uh, and, uh, and we get down to the revolving door, and the women are, have stopped making their circle now, and they can sense, you know, they can sense something is going on, so they all kind of stop. 
And uh, Bane says to me, and they start going, there's a large women now. And Bane, my boss, my editor, says to me, um, okay, now now don't worry about it. You know, just stay behind me. We're gonna go, we're gonna go through out there. And, and don't worry, I'll take care of you because I'm, I'm used to this. And he was a general in the Air Force, a brigadier general, so he's large, he's used to working with large problems. So I said, okay, so I grabbed his, I grabbed his belt, and he went around <laughs> and the bottom door, he started coming out, and the women started going, mm -hmm. 180 mad ladies, okay? And, and, and we get out there, and Fane says, okay, calm down, everybody, calm down, and they go, mm -hmm. And he leads to a side and says, here's a little bit, like this. <laughs> You know, did you ever have your life pass before your eyes? You know, I saw myself at the age of 14. You were going on my first date. You know, it was really bizarre. Okay, and so Faith kind of stopped him and said, no, 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 no. He said, oh, seriously, now. He said, now, what's the problem? And, uh, and so the women got a spokes lady to come, who I just won. She came up, and she's holding a little sheet of paper with two complaints on it. Now, I'm, I, I'm expecting this great philosophical debate to you know, emerge, okay? I've got my little debating cards already. And uh, she said, uh, okay, we've got two complaints. The first complaint is that the three women that this cad drew on, on Carol's back, you know, the three ladies that he drew in the cartoon, looked like three of their own members. And they wanted to know why I picked them out specifically, okay? <laughs> See, you understand? <laughs> and I'm standing there, you know, and I'm thinking this is such a bizarre situation, and they've kind of surrounded us, and I start laughing, you know, because I'm kind of hysterical anyway. I'm a little worried about them hurting me. And then they come up with this thing about three of the members look like the three ladies I drew, and I start laughing. I said, no, 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 I just drew three of the three women. You know? <laughs> You know, I just made them up out of my mind. And they brought them in, and they did. They looked at them. And he says, yeah, okay, but what's the real problem here? Why are you so mad? Okay, I, I just want to show you this. And, uh, and uh, hang on now. Uh, at that time, I hope we can all see. I'm sure you can. Uh, at that time, when I would draw a cartoon, I would, uh, I would, start, I would start drawing Lady's face. I would draw the two cheeks, you know, these cheeks, okay, all right? All right. And then um, I draw the lady's nose. Now, this is the way I drew back then. I don't draw like this. I draw the eyes. Everybody I drew back then all looked like Nixon or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I know, it really does, doesn't it? Isn't that crazy? Okay, I draw their, I draw the little chin that we all have. Okay, can you all see this? Can you see this? Okay, maybe I should put it up here. Okay. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Draw the chin. I draw that, I draw that bump that we all have underneath our, uh, okay. I draw that little bump that we all have right underneath our nose, you know, little, okay. I draw the neck, I draw the hair. Okay, like I said, the first thing they were mad at was that this looked like three of their own members. <laughs> but the biggest thing they were mad at thing that I've got my debating cards all ready, that I'm all set to have this philosophical debate. The biggest thing that they're mad at is the three women that I drew, they said, the three women that I drew all had their noses running. Have you seen? <laughs> they thought, have you seen? I'm standing here in a bunch of, you know, group of 180 mad people. And they're mad at me because they thought I was drawing that their nose was running, and I was just drawing that bump that we all have on our top lip. And that's the first time that I realized that the people in Dayton are weird. <laughs> they are. They're strange. Now, now um, I, and I know this for a fact, okay? I've never been
been able to get them mad at the things that I wanted them to get mad at. They're always getting mad at bizarre things like that. I was telling, I was telling my friend, well, where's, uh, where's she, uh, 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 Lori? You know, uh, I did up a cartoon. Uh, me and another cartoonist have, have been doing up some cartoons on the, some lady, some lady commissioner, okay? And her name was Babe Ferguson. Uh, uh, have some water. And uh, and uh, uh, her name is Babe Ferguson. She's a county commissioner. Oh, gone on for the last like three months. She had been indicted for stealing money. Okay, so I did up a cartoon on this lady. Now, now this just happened just recently. Okay, I did up this cartoon on this lady, and and I had her standing there, and uh, I put a little button on her. Okay, that said Babe Ferguson. Okay, you know, so she's standing there like a woman, and she got a little button right there saying Babe Ferguson. Well, uh, I get this phone call from Babe Ferguson's, uh, 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 from somebody at a radio station who is a talk show, and uh, he's accusing me. Well, he said, no, he said to me, now, I'm on the John now, I'm sitting on the Carlin. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that, that's crude, but I was, I was in the John. And Marion brings the phone into the John and said, somebody on, on this talk radio wants to talk to you. And I said, yeah. And he says, hey, uh, you're on the air right now. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, uh, are you this crazy? See, this is the life of another talker. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, did you know that Babe Ferguson had a mastectomy? And I said, oh, no, sorry. You know, I thought it just happened, OK? I said, oh, dear, I'm sorry. He said, uh, well, didn't you know that before you drew the cartoon? Now, but this isn't very funny now. This is, you know, but this is true. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, everybody is accusing you of making fun of Babe Ferguson's mass second. I said, how? What do you mean? I said, no, some picture of Babe Ferguson acting like Nixon saying, you know, uh, uh, I am the commissioner or something like that, you know? And uh, well, it turns out that when I drew this button here, okay, you know, I shaded it around the outside so the button kind of, you know, stick, stuck out. And she thought that I was making fun of her having a mastectomy. Now, do you understand this? Well, I just found out at dinner when we were over at the, at the dead cow stuff <laughs> uh, that me and this other cartoonist, uh, another cartoonist who, who she accused of something else, we were in a $13 million lawsuit. Okay? Isn't this weird? Okay? Now, you see, she doesn't get mad at me claiming that she's Nixon, but she gets mad at me because she thinks I'm making fun of a mastectomy that I didn't know anything about, see? And so they are weird, they're strange and different. <laughs> um, uh, another thing about dating, I'm syndicated in a lot of newspapers. Very nice being syndicated, it's not a brag, it's just a fact, a, a fact. Every, a, a lot of cartoonists get syndicated. I get letters from all over the country, okay? Um, you know, most of the time, if you're mad at an editor or something, or if you're mad at someone in a newspaper, you usually take a piece of paper and you'll and you'll write, dear cartoonist, you know, I think that you ought to suck an egg, you know, <laughs> uh, a reader, you know, and then you'll take that letter and you fold it up and you'll stick it in an envelope and send it off. Most of my letters are like that, except the letters from Dayton and the letters from from, from what is it, Scarsdale? Scar Scottsdale, Scottsdale, Arizona. The Scar people there, man, our sister city. <laughs> people in Scottsdale, Scarsdale, whatever that is, in Arizona, people in Dayton, if they don't like a cartoon, they don't look around for a piece of paper. They rip the cartoon out of the editorial page, okay? And then they take a magic, ma a magic marker or a crayon or something and say, you fascist pig. And then they don't, and they don't fold it. They crumple it, you know, up like this. And they take it in an envelope. And so I can tell um, um, uh, my weekly mail, you know, has... Ohio, Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, Scottsdale, <laughs> you know, you can root that envelope because they have that wad of paper in the center. And I always got to figure that they wrote in crayon because that was the only thing that they were given, you know. <laughs> okay, okay, the only thing I, I learned at that luncheon, and I'm, I'm babbling off the mouth and I shouldn't be, uh, the only other thing I learned at that luncheon uh, from Malden and from John Trichetti is the use of our humor. Uh, the greatest the greatest movement, the greatest thing that's happened in edit no, no, the most monumental thing that has happened in editorial cartooning in the last like ten years has been the use of humor. Um, now uh, uh, what's his name? Today, you know, the uh, the speaker today. Uh, the other one. Stephen Hess. 
Stephen Hess was talking about at, uh, uh, in his speech about how the cartoonists today do not get as mad as the cartoonists back in like the 1940s, where they were showing a lot of cartoons of like uh, Hitler. And like, have you ever seen the cartoon of the, of the swastika that looks like a juggernaut and it's, and it's rolling over the cities, you know, uh, eating up Poland and stuff? You know, you know what I'm talking about? These were very heavy handed cartoons. These, these were great cartoons. These were very effective, okay? And Stephen Hess had said that he did not think that the cartoonists today, the fairly new cartoonists today, who lean heavily on their humor, uh, got as mad as the cartoonists did back in the heydays, back in the 40s and 50s. And I didn't say anything during the speech because, I, because it was his speech, but, but you know, what's going on today is that a lot of editorial cartoonists now are using humor more in their editorial cartoons. But what they're doing, they're using it to get your attention. And you know, uh, the good cartoons that are funny are never just funny for the sake of being funny. Uh, uh, the good cartoons today will make you laugh and then get you mad right afterwards. See, if you see if you see Nixon's head like coming out of a parlor or something, you know, or uh, I've got a couple of cartoons here where, uh, that I'm going to show you where. Your first impression will be the, <laughs> and then you'll see that it's not fair about what I'm doing to this man, and then you'll get mad, and that's what, and, and that's the greatest cartoon that I could do, and most anyone else can do, is to make you laugh, and then to, and then to get you mad, because if you laugh, then you'll keep turning to me, and you'll say, hey, I laughed at that guy one day, I'll, I'll turn to him again, and if it gets you mad, then it's making you think, which is the cartoon assumption, okay? So, um, so let me show you a few of these cartoons. And uh, now let me see now. I'll stand, I'll stand up here and I'll use the mic. Uh, can I turn on, uh, uh, I don't go to the first cartoon yet, okay? I, I mean, you can turn on the machine, but, uh, 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 but make it a white, a white space up there. You know, turn it, the, the, the thing right before the cartoon, okay? That's good, okay. All right, let me see if I can turn on this light here and see if this works. It does, it really does work. Okay, hang on now, hang on now, let me move everything. Oh. Showing cartoons of slides is very similar to, uh, I can also do duckies and everything. <laughs> uh, show, showing cartoons in slides is very similar to, to showing pictures of your kids, you know, growing up. Because they are kind of like children. I mean, they're, you're, you know, they're a product of your, of your work and, and your energy. And, uh, and uh, I like a lot of these cartoons. Some of them are fairly weak. I'm not quite sure uh, which, ones, uh, which ones you'll like and which ones you won't like. But, uh, but uh, let me explain uh, before each cartoon. I've got about 30 of them, but I'll try to run through them very quickly, OK? And I don't want to keep you any longer than you have to. OK. Uh, the first cartoon will, is just one of the last cartoons I did on President Ford. Uh, President Ford you know, was kind of a stumble bum. And uh, he was a nice guy, but he bumped his head a lot and stuff. And he was also somehow connected with Nixon, you know. You know. And, so, uh, and, so, and so I did up this cartoon the day that he lost the election. Okay, you can show it. Uh, there. I, I just have Jerry Ford, he's all beat up, and he's saying, now, you won't have Jerry Ford to kick himself around anymore, okay? <laughs> all right, now, now I put this cartoon in the paper, and my boss said, Hey, listen, he's on the TV right now, and he's, and, he's, and he's hoarse, and he can't talk because he was obviously so choked up from the night before. And so Betty is talking with, for him. Do you remember that scene? He was on the TV, and he was, he was giving his, uh, his consoling speech or whatever that is. And so my boss said, hey, uh, uh, you can't run this cartoon today because, because there's going to be a lot of pro-sentiment for Jerry Ford. He said, so hurry up and do up, do up another cartoon. So I did up this next cartoon in about 25 minutes. It's the fastest I've ever done a cartoon. And it's probably the most reprinted cartoon I've ever had. Okay, and, and uh, you can, uh, next. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It's so simple, and people really love that. Uh, uh, they ran it in both Time and Newsweek, and it was really, it was really fun. I, I made a lot of money, and it was nice, you know. <laughs> 
Okay, um, uh, the next cartoon is, uh, now, now these are not necessarily in, in alphabetical order or whatever, um, because I put them in fairly here and scare them. Uh, the next cartoon is, uh, uh, do you remember about two years ago, Canada had some scandals in their, in their, uh, in the Canadian Mounties, do you remember that? And they had uh, wiretaps and buggings and break-ins, and it sounded very similar to the thing that we had gone through a few years before. Okay, so you can show this next cartoon. A one Mountie is saying, break-ins, buggings, cover-ups, what's gotten into the Royal Canadian Mountains? <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll, I'll work the focus just a little bit. Looks a little bit, looks a little bit unfocused here, but, but maybe that's just my eyes. I don't have my glasses on. Okay, the next cartoon. Um, uh, uh, speaking, you know, speaking of Nixon, uh, the next cartoon was uh, it was right after one of the last two popes died, and uh, and they were looking for a pope, and at the same day uh, a news story came out. It was when. Carter's polls were very, very low, and they had polled people, and they had found out that Nixon's polls were higher than Carter's polls were that day. I mean, which is, I mean, you know, Nixon's worst polls were higher than Carter's polls. And so I get up this cartoon, just next. Now there's Pat, she's saying, no, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, now this next one is kind of a favorite of mine. I, 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 like, I, I like cartoons like this. Uh, uh, I, love, I love combining stories, okay? I mean, like this was a combination of two stories. And I wouldn't have done a cartoon on just one story, but when the two stories worked, it kind of it made it a nice cartoon. Uh, this next one was a combination of two stories, too. It came out in the papers, do you remember, about a year ago, that Mickey Mouse turned 50 years old. Okay, do you remember that? And uh, just breathe heavy, and I don't know. And uh, uh, and at the same and the same day they found that out. Do you remember the GAO was having a, a lot of a lot of problems and scandals at that time? And they found out that the GAO had somebody named Donald Duck on their payroll. Did you ever read that? It sounds bizarre, but they did. He was making like fifty thousand a year or something. And so, I, and so I made a combination of, uh, of the two stories. And I had Mickey Mouse, like an old bum, kind of sitting on a park bench. OK, you can do it now. And there's Mickey, OK, and he's got a bottle of rum over there and stuff. And, and he's talking to some man. And he, and he, here, fix the focus just a little bit. And Mickey's saying, uh, then after Fantasia, all the big money went to live action. My royalty checks stopped coming in. Minnie left me. I had to have Pluto put to sleep. <laughs> Huey, Dewey, and Louie became Moonies. But I hear the Ducks doing well. He's a big shot at the GAO. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. I like that. That's funny. OK, let me see. Uh, government, oh, please help me out. I forget. Uh, accounting office. Governmental accounting office, right? right. OK. Okay, the next cartoon is just about women priests. I, 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 uh, I do a lot of cartoons. I'm a Catholic, okay? And, uh, and, and so uh, I don't think it's fair that we don't have women priests. Uh, uh, and so I, I do have a number of cartoons, and, and they'll be peppered through all through the speech. So you can just show this next cartoon. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> okay, let me see. Uh, the next one is, oh, about the dollar being down. You know, uh, uh, the dollar's been down for the last two or three years. And, uh, and it seems that nobody wants to take the dollar, especially abroad. So I, so I had this little street scene in Paris. I think this is the one. Okay, next. And the man is saying, hurry, Ethel, I found somebody who takes American dollars. <laughs> you know, the weird thing about this cartoon uh, uh, is that it's blurry. That's one weird thing about it. Uh, the weird thing about this cartoon is that I was sitting in my office one day, about two or three weeks after I did it, and there was a news story on the on Good Morning America uh, during the news pro the news section, 
And they, and, they, and they showed a picture of this cartoon. And they said, this is the first American cartoon that was ever reprinted in Pravda. And they had picked this cartoon out of Time Magazine to show the terrible plight of the American money and how bad it's gotten. And they showed my cartoon. And so, so I saw this, I got dying. I got all these phone calls from people that I knew who said, did you see how it's been for America? And so I got a guy at, at University of Dayton who knows Russian. And I sent, the, I sent Pravda a bill for 30 rubles, which is the equivalent of 50 bucks. And, I, and it was all written in Russian. I'd never heard anything, and I never understood that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let me see. Oh, the next cartoon. OK, uh, you know, the next cartoon is just uh, is, uh, uh, is a dirty cartoon. I wanted to show you the power of the press, okay? I can do this. And it's just about the space shuttle. And you know what the space shuttle is, you know, the two little planes and they carry them around and stuff like that. And I just thought, you know, this would be just a funny kind of throwaway idea. It was one of those days I didn't feel very much about, about, about something I didn't have very much to say. And so I, I just did this up. Okay, you can show it. I got a guy at Mission Control, I say, quick, get me Mission Control! <laughs> See now, see, now, the weird thing about this is I get paid for doing this, see? <laughs> see, isn't that marvelous? Isn't that a good job, you know? Oh, well, okay, I, I, I love it. I think it's very bizarre. Okay, uh, uh, I just put in, uh, I, I just put this next cartoon in because I, I wanted to, uh, you know, I'm from Ohio and we had Woody Hayes. And uh, Woody had been going around hitting a lot of photographers and stuff like that. And he had been caught at it two or three times. And so I just get up this next question. It had uh, offensive lineman, offensive back, offensive and offensive. <laughs> Ohio State tried to get us to retract that cartoon for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, uh, this other cartoon is just about uh, women priests, uh, another women priest. Okay, there's a priest there and he says, women priests, nonsense. God made man in his own image and likeness. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, I get a lot of trouble. See, I'm a Catholic, and, and a lot of these priests don't like that. And, and uh, I never understand why. Mm. OK, let me see. This next, I don't have too many more. I'm all halfway through. Uh, the next cartoon, no, I'm not. Oh, God, i got to speed it up a little bit. Uh, next cartoon, oh, it's just about Jimmy Carter. And, and uh, uh, after he got elected, he decided that he was going to purify the White House. And so he wasn't going to have any liquor. OK, liquor at the White House. Okay, so you can show this cartoon. It, it's at a banquet, and Jimmy Carter is saying, sorry, no more liquor at the White House. I want the glass. <laughs> oh. Okay, and the next one is just a, a series one. It's about big oil. Okay, uh, a big oil, and he says, uh, you want coal, we own the mines. You want oil and gas, we own the wells. You want nuclear energy, we own the uranium. You want solar power? We only, uh, solar power isn't feasible. <laughs> I like that. That's probably my favorite cartoon because it really. The it, Libertarian Party reprinted that one. What? Li libertarian Party. Right, right, I know that. Yeah, those libertarians love me. Um, okay. Uh, 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 no, don't shoot it yet. No, don't, uh, don't push the next one yet. Uh, uh, we had, uh, 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 this next cartoon is about, is about, um, well, yeah, okay, uh, it's self-explanatory, I guess. I'm leaving it. Okay, the next one. Big bomber, and it says, here's our latest weapon. It's cheap, light, and it explodes on impact. <laughs> at the same time, at the same time the Pinto was having their problems, another, another uh, car-related manufacturer was having their problems. So I had this idea about having a a man trying to get rid of his wife, okay? And so you can show the next cartoon. The man is holding some uh, car keys and she's saying, Ralph, I didn't know you cared. A brand new Pinto and with Fire School 500. <laughs> and look at, the, look at the grin on the guy's face. <laughs> you gotta clear that up just a little bit, darling, if you would. Um, let me see. 
Okay, uh, uh, next cartoon is just, uh, it is just fairly, it's just fairly simple. Uh, Jimmy's, Jimmy's polls were down for such a long time and he kept saying, I don't care, it doesn't bother me. And, and he reminded me of a, uh, uh, of a famous man that's on a, on a magazine cover every week. Okay, you can show it. Say what me word? <laughs> <laughs> and it really works for him, you know. Yeah, notice how similar he and Alpha D look. Amazing. <laughs> Okay, um, let me see. Oh, um, uh, next cartoon is one of my things again. You know, uh, uh, just like with the uh, uh, with the uh, 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 the space shuttle. I enjoy this kind of. This isn't dirty, but it's kind of gross. Uh, every time that a train derailed for a period of two or three months, every time one derailed, it was always carrying poisonous gas somewhere around the country. The same train derailed fifty times. It was carrying the same poisonous gas, and they would have to you know, uh, evacuate a city. And so I just had a kid, you know, uh, 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 who bought a, an exact replica train, okay? <laughs> train set, exact replica. <laughs> I love the dog, though. See, you see, you see, that dog is my favorite, you know? Oh, that's the thing I love. Okay. Um, I don't like Jerry Brown very much. Uh, uh, I never have. Uh, uh, I was a little taken with him last, uh, you know, in 1976. Is that the last one? Yeah, 1976. Because he sounded different. But then he, he did that thing about uh, Proposition 13, made a switch around, and he's, now he's made about two or three, you know, flip-flops. And so... Oh shoot, I'm sorry. No, this is about the shop, uh, uh, needing a place to live. And, and I, I, I did a little hunt for you. He said, uh, he's sick, homeless, and unloved, abandoned by his friends, afraid to show his face. Let him know there is someone who cares, someone who wants to, to help. He doesn't need much, a chauffeur, a cook, a gardener, or bare necessities. Please help without the show. <laughs> you know, for more information, write to uh, H. Kissinger, uh, Dave Manhattan Bank. Okay. Well, now I don't know where we are. Let me see. The Shaw. Oh, gosh. Oh, I hope I'm not mixed up here. Let me, let me no, uh, just give me a second here. Just give me a second. Okay. Now. Okay. Let's, uh, uh, let's see where I am. I, I think the next one is going to be, uh, is going to be this next thing. Okay. So, oh, I, I don't know. I can't read my race. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is just about, you know, the Kennedy campaign. I mean, when Kennedy announced, and Carter said that he was with, uh, 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 that he never mentioned Chapter Quiddy. So he says, I'll never dredge up Teddy's past. That's all one under the bridge. Sure, others may go off the deep end about Chapter Quiddy, but I say let Ted sink or swim on the issues. Politically, it may be hard to keep my head above water, but I'll cross that bridge when I go. <laughs> oh, gosh. No, I, I like that cartoon because everything worked. Everything really worked on that. Okay, uh, uh, this next cartoon is about uh, 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 Hamilton, Jordan, and uh, Coke. And you've seen it, okay? Uh, uh, yeah, Jimmy Carter, he says, oh, go on, go on, go on, try, go no. They go, sniff, they go, sniff, sniff, it's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me see. Uh, the, uh, uh, the next cartoon, 
Let's just look at it and I'll explain it. Oh yeah, this is about uh, the Carter being attacked by that rabbit. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, 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 the next cartoon is about, and I'm going to show it yet. The next cartoon is about, is about the Mormon church. And do you remember uh, the lady just got excommunicated from the Mormon church because she was backing, uh, she was backing uh, uh, the ERA. Did you read about that? Or you all heard about it. Okay, so I thought about, I thought about how to put this across. And I thought about the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Okay, you can show the next cartoon. Oh dear. Okay. Okay. Go back to the rabbit then. There's the rabbit. Okay. Now go to the next one. No. You gotta go back to the rabbit. Now go to the Mormon. That's good. And and there's the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And the priest is saying. And now the Mormon Tabernacle Choir will sing their medley of stout-hearted men. You're having my baby and get your biscuits in the oven and your buns in bed. <laughs> Oh, did I get letters on that? Oh, that was fun. Gee, that was fun. I love it. Okay, I just got about five more cartoons here, so we'll almost be done. Uh, the, uh, uh, the next one is just about Burt Lance and Jimmy Carter. You, you know how Burt Lance was playing rather loosely with our with our with our money and with his money and with Jimmy Carter's money and the bank of Georgia's money. And so I I, I, mean, I thought it was kind of bizarre. A uh, born again Christian having somebody like that as his best friend. So I just did this church scene. And he says, Put it back, Bert. <laughs> okay, the, okay, the next cartoon is about uh, Vice Premier Dung or Tang. Do you remember uh, uh, the Chinese guy who came over here? And he went, uh, he went all around the country. He went down south, went to the west, he went all around. And, uh, uh, and then he went back to China, and that's when the new Vietnam War started. Do you remember? Okay, so I had, I, I had this vice premier sitting on a psychiatrist's couch. Okay, you can show it. And he says, uh, I don't know what got into me. I went to America. I, I ate hamburgers and drank Coca-Cola. I wore a 10-gallon hat, and then I invaded Vietnam. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Okay, uh, uh, this next one is just about, uh, uh, it, it, it's not in sequence here, but uh, it, it's Jerry Ford. And you remember when we all had swine flu or when everybody was getting inoculated? And it turned out everybody who was inoculated started falling over dead, or at least the older people. And so then they stopped it, and then they wanted to show that it was really kind of safe. So then Jerry Ford went on TV, and he had the inoculation. You remember they gave it using a gun. And, you know, he was kind of klutz, and so I did up this cartoon the day that he got shot. See, it's harmless. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, the, uh, the next cartoon is about, it's just about uh, cancer research. And uh, it seems that everything gives us cancer now. Everything, you know. Uh, smoking gives us cancer. Uh, uh, you know, sugar, the saccharin gives us cancer. Everything does. And then all of a sudden, Something brand new gave us cancer, hair dryers. And so I had this laboratory scene. Okay, you can shoot it. And the two rats, <laughs> and they're saying, I remember the good old days when we only had to smoke a few cigarettes and eat sacrament? Two more cartoons. The next cartoon that most of you have seen, or a lot of you have seen, is about the Philadelphia police. And uh, they've been very brutal. Uh, 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 the Justice Department went against them and, and tried to bring them to court, and then they screwed up. And it didn't stop them from being brutal, because they really are. I've lived there for a while. And so I wanted to show the kind of using their, uh, their police stick rather heavily. So I used to up the scene. A little girl, she says, Officer, can you get my cat out of the tree? And he says, Sure. Blam, blam. <laughs> oh, goodness. 
Okay, now this next cartoon, and if somebody can get the lights, we're right, I'll be right after this is over. Uh, uh, the next, this last cartoon was just about natural gas. Uh, 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 about two years ago, in, in my state, in a lot of other states, people were freezing because the gas companies could not put out a, enough natural gas to keep everybody warm. And so, uh, so I did up this nursery rhyme. Okay. It said, once upon a time, there lived a big power company who promised all of its subjects that they had enough gas to last everyone through the winter. But when it got cold, the power company tried to tap the gas, and all it found was a big empty hole. Moral, some power companies don't know their gas from a hole in the ground. <laughs> okay, lights. Now, not to you know, you, uh, make this any longer. Do we have any questions? Because if we, if we do, I'll answer some. No. Yes. All right. Right. Now that you're older than thirteen, <laughs> would you would you still rather be in Farmer's Almanac? I think that's great, but I'm not living for it, and I'm not working for it. And I don't really, you know, it's not my goal. A lot of our cartoonists, there's a lot of good cartoonists around the country who made winning prizes their goal. And when they didn't win prizes, they started thinking of, of themselves not very good. And so the awards started becoming a detriment to them. And there's, I can name you five who were great about 10 years ago and who did not win and who, when we cartoonists get together, you know, for our meetings, that's all they talk about is, uh, well, there's only one thing I would have liked in my life, and that's a cool surprise. Or, or they talk about, did you know in 1952, it was between me and her block, you know? And it's sad, and, it, and they don't think that they're very good. So I've been trying to work to not make that a goal. If I win, I got I wouldn't give it back, but, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, the Pulis prices are, are, are okay. It's lousy. Uh, I just talked to a cartoonist in Aspen, Colorado, who, uh, 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 who's been drawing a comic strip, and then all of a sudden he stopped drawing about eight months ago because some people told him that they didn't think a strip was very good. And there he is, I mean, some important people, like, like his editor and stuff like that, okay? I mean, it sounds kind of, you know, funny, but it's not funny because he stopped drawing the strip. And he stopped it because he liked the strip, but someone else told him that, that they didn't. And there, you know, you're hinging whether you're good or not on someone else, and that's where it's bad. So, so feel surprises are nice. You know, Frank Wood, Frank, uh, Frank, Frank Miller has one, and I think it's, I think it's marvelous. But you know, there's lots of them who don't. So I, you know, I, I, it doesn't bother me. I like the money. I like the money from being syndicated. It's, it's very nice. Okay, well, any more? Yes. Um, if you got an offer right now. Would you rather like uh, take a job? With more money in, like, say, Chicago, or would you rather be with the weird people in Dayton? Well, uh, uh, did y'all hear that? If, I, if I'd like to uh, get more money in Chicago or be with the weird people, more money, really. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind. No.